<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, today is the 29th of uh, June uh, 2022, and we'll talk about two subjects. We'll begin with uh, John Johansson, and we'll pay homage to him, an important North American architect. Here he was, uh, a graduate from Harvard and uh, a rather unconventional uh, architect. He lived a long life, and he built some very interesting buildings. So John Johansson of Norwegian uh, extraction, so to speak. So uh, here he is, here, here it is what he wrote. I feel confident that most others with me at that time, uh, I am Pei, Paul Rudolph, Bruno Tsevi, Barnes, and those later, Coburn, Franzen, and others would agree with me that Harvard was an invaluable education in discipline and in the instilling of principles of the modern movement. Though we studied under the masters, we were not indoctrinated into a modern style, but given the guidelines to investigate an architecture for our time and circumstance. And we, the second generation of moderns, brought about and witnessed in the 1950s and 1960s what will well be regarded as the golden years of the high modern. This is what John uh, Johansson wrote. After graduation, Johansson began his career with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill in New York City and was loaned out to work on the United Nations building. He then settled into New Can Canaan, Connecticut, along with Marcel Breuer and Landis Gores, Philip Johnson and Elliot Noyes. Breaking away from classic designs, the five gained international acclaim in the 1950s as advocates of the mo modernist standard form follows function while living and working in avant-garde houses they designed. The architecture they created in the early days in New Can Canaan would later designate them as the five Harvard Five. Some drawings, uh, drawings, you know, like architects do, maybe nothing e exceptional, but this one is a little bit different, you know, uh, an organic or a, a kind of a bio-architecture. I go quickly, so uh, we have also time to talk about uh, St. Peter and St. Paul and architecture. So we are still, uh, you know, with uh, John Johansson. This is uh, an experimental house, uh, house project uh, he made, and I think I find it very interesting. Uh, this is different because, uh, you know, not every design that an architect imagines uh, is, uh, you know, uh, accepted easily sometimes by clients and so on. Early biomorphic design, this is a, you know, a, an early attempt by him to assume uh, what, what might be called bioarchitecture. Now in 1949, imme immediately after the war, he built this, uh, you know, rather, you know, a modernistic house. But this kind of house you can find even today on the pages of um, Arch Daily and not only Arch Daily, his own house, his first house, he built another one, much more interesting. But this was his first house uh, in Connecticut, 1950, uh, up, the upside down house. That's how it was called. Uh, I'm not going to read this now because uh, I don't want, to, I, I don't usually like to read, but uh, you see here that why was it called upside down? Because the living room is at the top and the bedrooms at the bottom. So, you know, this is rather unusual. Usually, uh, as you know, the living room uh, is uh, on the first floor, on the ground floor, on the first floor, and then the bedrooms are above. But an interesting uh, conception in a way, and although the house is thoroughly modern, because of this inversion and also because of the usage of stone, also has some organic qualities although the building in itself is rectangular, as you can see. Uh, it, it was uh, modified, um, you know, in time. I don't know who the client, uh, I mean, who the, the owner of the house is now. Um, anyway, some images. This was the house of uh, John Johansson from 1950, another house from 1955 in S uh, Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, this is what he wrote, my own investigations into the box led to Johansson house number one, which you saw. It was included in the Museum of Modern Art exhibit built in the US as a work typical of a graduate of um, 
Harvard Graduate School of Design. In 1955, I built a second glass box, the Mac McNiff House. In both these houses, it was the subtleties and articulation of the box that interest me, interested me over its presumed uh, purity. So I like this fact that he was not the slave of uh, so-called presumed purity, because life itself is not um, just pure. Of course, uh, it's nice to talk about the purity of the soul, but life also has, uh, you know, impurities. And, uh, you know, he, for, he employed the stone as some kind of accidental so-called organic impurity to break the whiteness and the cerebrality of the, of the you know, Cartesian box, destroyed and replaced by this house. Yeah, you know, it was, it was modified in this way, in the sense that, yes, the house that he built, this one, which was certainly much better than what followed, was destroyed and replaced by this one. A very sad uh, example of the foolishness of humankind. Uh, Pe the Peter and Patricia, hello, Peter, happy birthday to you, 1950 or so, another modernistic house by John Johansson. I go quickly because we didn't yet arrive at his most interesting and spectacular and specific work. He did evolve. He didn't uh, just create this kind of architecture uh, until the end of his long life. No, another house, 1952. So this was, you know, mid-century modernism, which has qualities. And, and, and uh, it's rather surprising that today, 70 years later, we still be like this. But he changed, you know, he changed more than we do. Uh, I don't know who this gentleman is. I regret actually he's in the picture, maybe some real estate agent. Uh, anyway, the house is what counts by John Johansson, another house. It's called uh, like a cave house, um, uh, you know, modern is mid-century. Uh, another house, he built a lot of houses, as you can see. Uh, there were some optimists then in the, in the world and in the United States because the Second World War ended. You know, let's hope the miserable, tragic war in Ukraine will end too, uh, which is... Uh, an incredible anachronism in the 21st century to attack a neighboring country like this, you know. It's just unbelievable. Uh, anyway, uh, what is this? This is a, it's called the spray houses, two houses of sprayed concrete. It's a, he did it for a show in Yugoslavia, yes, a trade fair in 1956. House number one of the two photos was never built, but house number two, in the second photo was built in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. So uh, look what he did. He's, he was continuously exploring new ways of doing architecture, new ways of, of uh, uh, building, uh, building houses. Not bad. I mean, you know, this looks avant-garde, so to speak, even for us today. And it was done almost 70 years ago. Uh, this, as you can see, was built in Zagreb. Uh, and now uh, another house, uh, again, uh, you know, the same kind of modernism, but uh, because of the centrality and the, you know, the three uh, wings of the house, uh, you know, uh, with something different, a little bit different. Another one, 1955. Anyway, these houses are a little bit uh, similar to each other. But this one is, is interesting, 1956. The bridge house, because he built it over the over the water, <clears throat> and I think it's a good example of a house where the architect asserts his will, but also uh, enters into a dynamic uh, relationship, uh, 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 dialectical relationship with nature. It's a fine house. I wouldn't mind living there myself if I had the chance. I I don't have the chance, and I will not have the chance. But it's a, it's a fine house by uh, John M. Johansson. You can forget the M. Uh, you know, the third name uh, or the middle name is always a nuisance in my case too. Uh, actually, I learned rather late to my shame that my first name is not Dan, but um, Yuan. Yes, Yuan, not Dan. 
anyway, I grew up with them, and uh, I, although I don't like it, but uh, what can I do? Uh, Bridge House, uh, we saw it. Uh, sorry about this picture. Another pristine, uh, modernistic uh, house by John jo Johansson. This one more pristine than, than some others. Lots of uh, artworks there on the walls. Now the labyrinth house, this one I love. I love, unfortunately, it was demolished by a criminal uh, man who, you know, uh, was irritated, I guess, by its uh, brilliance. 1966, so destroyed in 1988 by a, by a famous talk show, TV show, Phil Donahue, who owned the house next door at 114 and bought the property for more privacy. The house had been empty for several years and was attracting vagrants. Donahue said, why didn't someone take care of this building? Where were all these uh, caring building when, uh, people when the building was unoccupied? Well, he tried to justify his uh, crime. That is, he destroyed it. A very fine house and a very nice theme. Just think about it, the labyrinth, the labyrinth house. It looks good it, with very interesting spaces. And it's just unbelievable that it was, uh, it was destroyed. Uh, I hope I have other pictures. I should have other pictures. But if I don't, I apologize. And please remember, the Labyrinth House, you can find more pictures on the web. John Johansson, uh, what is this? Uh, the Telephone Pole House. Pole, pole, pole house. This is also interesting, uh, as something almost Japanese. He employs wood. As you can see, he was continuously exploring other ways to build houses. This is quite complex at the inside. As you can see, the structural system in wood has a complexity that uh, I'm almost sure, you know, the builders of the great uh, temples in Japan would have appreciated. John Johansson. Now, uh, the tube house. Uh, well, I don't know why it is called the tube house, but this one is interesting too. And I, interesting also, I see snow something that is uh, almost disappearing from our uh, site. We didn't have winter uh, this year in, uh, in uh, Romania, nor the past year. So welcome to the climate warming, which is not a joke. Uh, please, please, please do not cut down any tree. Do not neglect the trees. We need the trees badly. We need oxygen and we need to fight pollution. And we need to do something because it's not a joke. The, the levels of the seas are rising and the, the icebergs are melting. And certainly we didn't have winter. This is not a joke at all. Anyway, but unfortunately architects contribute to the causes of the climate warming. Uh, it's a fatality. 1974, this is a very interesting house by John Johansson, which he built for himself, called also Tent House, and you'll understand why. It was destroyed by fire later that year, 1974, and it was rebuilt in 1975. Uh, I hope I have better pictures. Look at this, you know, it's, I think it's very innovative and provocative for the eye. It functions very well, and it, it, it is built uh, uh, somehow uh, we could say uh, using ecological and sustainable uh, uh, principles. He also took into consideration ventilation, the flowing of air through the house, and it's both it's lightweight, but the the geometrical um, crystallization of the building uh, uh, shows um, willfulness and you know determination, uh, concentration and. I like it. I like this house, you know, with its um, uh, semi-transparent walls, you know, with its, its luminous. It's very interesting. Too bad it, uh, it was affected by fire, but he rebuilt it. John Johansson for himself and his wife. Um, the bedroom, and, but look at the walls, you know, uh, using, uh, well, artificial materials, but um, he, he dissolved. The, the usual opacity of the walls. Um, yeah, from 1974 or built in 1975. Maybe that's him there, I'm not sure. 
uh, he lived a long life, I think over 90. So this was the, the second house John Johansson built for himself and, 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 and his wife. Another house. He was an innovator and you'll see later in his life when he was around 90, he began to um, be very, very interested in nanotechnology, nano, na nanotecture, uh, the Richard Barna house. John Johansson. Now the chairs he didn't design, but they belong to the year unknown, the floating house, unbuilt, status unknown. Interesting idea, no? A floating house. So this man was not happy just to build and build and build. In, he also made projects, you could say uh, utopian projects. Now the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial, no picture, sorry. Uh, an elementary school in Columbus, Ohio, 1964. Um, here we are, we are seeing, uh, and we are going to see another major work by him, uh, exploring uh, different unconventional ways of doing public buildings. We only saw uh, private uh, buildings until now, but we are going to see now uh, his uh, architectural interventions in the field of public uh, architecture. And, uh, you know, even by the standards of today, this uh, has a certain level of, uh, you know, unusualness. John Johansson, and it is his birthday today. Um, now, he also built an embassy, the US embassy in, La in Dublin, 1964, a rather officious, official building. What can you do? It's, a, it's an embassy. I, uh, I almost, I would almost see it, you know, in, um, you know, uh, close to the Black Sea, you know, part of what is called the littoral. Uh, anyway, uh, without the, um, the embassy, US embassy in Ireland, I don't like uh, very much this building, but what can you do? It was an embassy, at least it has an inner, uh, an interior courtyard, which uh, makes it rather interesting and uh, you know pleasant for the people living there i mean working there the klaus memorial hall and opera in india indianapolis this is a very interesting building uh, i would say um and rather unknown and from 1965 um by john johansson When I showed it to Kenneth Frampton, he didn't know about it, and he was he admired very much this uh, this particular image, and I do too. is a is a is a fine building. Uh, too bad uh, I only have a few pictures of it, but it is less known. But it's uh, it's it's an excellent building by John Johansson. Maybe less excellent from this scene from here, a little bit uh, opaque and monumental. Anyway, an opera building and memorial. Maybe with all those banners uh, on the walls, it gets a little bit uh, better. Now the labyrinth house, okay, I'm so happy that I have other pictures. We already saw one picture of this house which was destroyed by that uh, insensitive man. Uh, look at the plan and the labyrinth it is, or approximately a labyrinth, although the classical labyrinth is different because it has a center, uh, but this one doesn't, but still is very interesting because the, of the intricate spaces. And uh, it's, it's a fragmented house again and again. We see an architect who was explorative. He was exploring all the time. And, um, well, you see this sign here with, uh, you probably know, it's, it's an excellent uh, website created by an architect in Suchava, a Romanian architect of houses, where you can see many, many, many so-called old forgotten houses. They are not so old and they are not really forgotten, but um, it's an excellent uh, uh, you know, compilation of uh, remarkable houses, modern houses. 
So this is the, the labyrinth house by uh, John Johansson, which that, uh, uh, you know, ma that man, uh, the neighbor destroyed it. It's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable, but uh, humans are notorious for doing uh, ridiculous, uh, if not uh, foolish uh, gestures all the time. Okay, John Johansson, the labyrinth house, now the Orlando library in 1966, uh, rather dynamic and, um, you know, uh, engaging uh, with its uh, sculpturalness, the Orlando uh, library, Maybe this kind of uh, monumentality is not so, um, you know, uh, uh, pleasing to us today, but um, he tried something, John Johansson. He worked a lot with concrete, what can you do? But you see, he didn't leave the concrete, uh, you know, without some kind of a so-called artistic treatment. He tried to humanize it, if I can, if I can say so. Now, this theater, uh, mechanic theater, is an excellent building, and unfortunately, it was destroyed. 1964, 1967, I so regret, and there was opposition from the community of architects. Unfortunately, they lost. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, yes, it's a brutalist work. It's uh, used a lot of concrete, but, um, they should not have been destroyed. It's a very good building. It was a very good building. A theater, and he built another one. We are going to see it. Uh, he was a, a very skillful architect. Now, the telephone pole house, which we already saw a picture or two, uh, here, this is the house. We already saw, I think, this image. Here he is on the right with Lebia Suds on the left. Uh, Lebia Suds, an interesting so called visionary architect. He died uh, in 2012. Um, anyway, uh, I was a little bit nostalgic because I knew personally Lebius and we even had a friendly relationship. Life, life ends at one point for all of us. Uh, 1969 uh, library, uh, look at this, you know, is this work to be ignored? I don't think so. Is it a sustainable work? No, it's not. It used a lot of, you know, uh, it's a massive work, but, but I think it has some qualities, uh, you know, it's dynamic, it's culturally interesting, and uh, both a day at night, John Johansson. Maybe even the trees uh, were happy that this building, uh, monumental as it is, uh, was, was built. Because, you know, the, even if, yes, it was not a uh, sustainable building, but it has a long vital, a vital, you know, uh, spirit. And that is important for any architecture. Here you see the plans so small that you cannot study them. But you see, he was uh, animating the building with a, uh, some movement. It's not, it's not stiff. John Johansson. Now this one, the Mummer Theater in Oklahoma City from 1970, an excellent work, a met metabolist work, if I can call it so. Uh, look at the plan. Uh, and then you see images of this uh, remarkable building. This one was destroyed. Again, hard to believe, but it was. What do we see here? We see the joy of art, the joy of movement, the joy of being free or attempting to be free. Uh, what else is art if not this? You know, it, it, it breaks my heart that this building was destroyed. You know, it, it's. We are in a mad world. We live in a mad world. What can we do? Uh, yeah, unafraid of using color, unafraid of uh, you know being playful because there is a lot of playfulness here. Um, a very fine building and, and the joyous building because playful. Playful, yes, please, dear students, don't forget to be playful. You cannot be creative if you are not playful. In the absence of playfulness, 
you cannot create. It's my conviction and not only mine. Johann Heisinger wrote a beautiful book called Homo Ludens. Only Homo Ludens, meaning the, you know, the playing human being can truly create. So please be playful because playfulness brings joy in your work and without joy, you cannot create. You have to have joy. Well, too bad that, you know, the malefic forces of life and of human beings sometimes win. You still have to continue, be playful, uh, be creative, assert the forces of life. Do not say no to life and don't be timid, don't be stiff. Uh, college, uh, you know, the 1972, so that period uh, when the students wanted to change the world, when they fought against the war in Vietnam, when they brought on the musical scene, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones and so on, Creedence Clearwater Revival, there was something beautiful in the air at the end of the 60s and at the beginning of the 70s. You know, students having long hair, dressing like hippies and so on. And then John Johansson building a campus for the students, you know, uh, with a certain level of uh, non-conformism and playfulness again. We should bring back that spirit, it's important. Otherwise we die of boredom and of other reasons as well. Uh, an, an elementary school, uh, I don't have pictures, the plastic tent house, uh, unfortunately, I only have this uh, image of it was not built, but the very idea to build a, a house of plastic, a plastic tent house is an interesting one, 1975, but with very organic uh, forms, as you can see. That's it. So sorry for this uh, imperfect presentation, uh, but at least you know now something about John Johansson. And now very quickly, we'll look at some uh, 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 unusual churches built for St. Peter and uh, St. Paul, because today is the day of St. Peter and St. Paul. So St. Peter and Paul churches, here is, a, you know, uh, maybe a strange uh, picture, but in, in, in the rush of time is the only one I found with the two saints, St. Peter and St. Paul. Let's wish happy birthday to all the Peters in the world and to all the uh, Petrinas in the world and to all Pauls in the world and Paulina and so on. We start with this building, uh, unknown building in, um, in a small place in Pennsylvania in the United States, St. Peter and Paul Church in Beaver, Pennsylvania, uh, was built by these people again, 1972. There was something magical at that time, at the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, Tony Stitchon project architect. So this modern church uses local stone, wood and slate with bands of stained glass windows to enclose and shelter its sacred space. It's asymmetrical and roundy shape is accented with stone buttresses and wide overhanging eaves that appear to hug the ground and then rise to soaring vaults in two places. At the altar paralleling, paralleling third street and at the entrance opposite, it's slate covered, supports slant inward to emphasize the altar space within. Further along the walls, gill-like sections of stained glass make the interior of the church remarkably light, emphasizing its vaulted ceiling and they successfully tie the church to its corner side. Anyway, words, words, words. This is the building and I, I find it interesting and, uh, you know, unexpectedly, uh, you know, engaging uh, by an unknown architect, but uh, there's some interesting uh, parts here. And I wish I could, I, I, I could found, find more pictures. I found a few, but uh, not, uh, not many. Unfortunately, is this uh, conventional piece, which I'm sure was not built by the architect, but the building makes me think a little bit about the fish church built by uh, Harrison Abramovich that Ren Kolhas liked. This is also a good building, uh, an excellent building, but, but I don't have uh, too many pictures of it. But look at the stained glass window, that, which is so, uh, you know, it's, it's modern, it's dynamic. 
and then the stonework also, uh, you know, done uh, the stonework uh, rather unusually and with a certain degree of freedom. A, a very good building by an unknown, an unknown person. Now, Basilica dei Santi Pietro e Paolo in Rome. This one I visited with some students from Minku uh, a few years ago, and uh, uh, the students were ravished. They, they, they didn't like it. They thought this was not a church. It, it, it was a fascist church. It was built during Mussolini's time. It is a fascist architecture, but even the fascists built for God. And yeah, it's, it's, it's an architecture that uh, mimics, uh, you know, so-called classical architecture, but it's much more, it's simplified and uh, has a, I don't know very well how to describe. It, it's not a church one can ignore. And again, it was built for St. Peter and St. Paul. So today is the day of St. Peter and St. Paul and appropriately we talk about this as well. So it's a fascist church that uh, made some students from uh, Bucharest very uncomfortable. We, we, we spent some time inside sitting on the chairs, on the benches, and we see the benches here. Uh, it depends on what one expects from a church. You know, it's, uh, yes, it's very different from <clears throat> Romanian chairs, uh, churches or <clears throat> Orthodox churches, it's true, but uh, it was, uh, it's still, a, you know, a serious building done with a different sens sensitivity or sensibility. Here you see it from, uh, from far away. Um, so it's a basilica built for St. Peter and St. Paul in Rome very close to Eur or is part of Eur, which is the, <clears throat> the new city in Rome uh, built by the fascists, by the fascist government, by Mussolini. Uh, I actually like the, I, I imagine these chairs were placed there in this way after the pandemic. And, uh, but I like them even like this, with, 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 with maybe even more without people sitting on them. It almost looks like a, like an artistic installation. Uh, these chairs there in the in the middle of uh, of this uh, fascist church uh, built in Rome. Here it is with a picture from uh, you know an, uh, all the time. It's not a bad building, but yes. Um, you have to have a certain disposition to uh, vibrate positively to it. Now we arrived to a few pictures of this famous cathedral. Uh, sorry, the spelling there is not quite correct. Uh, built by Sir Christopher Wren in London and is the largest cathedral in London, St. Paul Cathedral. Uh, here it is. You can miss it in London and indeed it is. Um, uh, you know, a major presence in the urban fabric of London, St. Paul's Cathedral. It's just St. Paul this time without St. Peter. Um, unfortunately, I had no time to include also St. Peter in Rome, which everybody knows. Uh, but um, anyway, as I said, this is a very short uh, uh, you know, presentation about a complex subject, building for St. Peter and St. Paul. London, St. Paul Cathedral, Sir Christopher Wren, a remarkable architect, something the best architect uh, England or Great Britain ever had. He was not even an architect. He never studied architecture. He was a, a scientist, a physicist, but uh, he built at least 40 churches, uh, including uh, St. Paul Cathedral in London, plus many, many, many other buildings. Please check the works of Sir Christopher Wren, a remarkable architect. And here you see St. Paul's Cathedral from the building from a huge mall that Jean Nouvel built across the street from, uh, from uh, St. Paul Cathedral. So the glass slanting walls belong to the mall built by Jean Nouvel 
who quite uh, sensitively and intelligently created this rift, this uh, opening into his building to direct the view towards God or the house of God, St. Paul's uh, Cathedral by uh, Christopher Wren, a very intelligent uh, design decision by Jean Nouvel. An image from the inside, it is a splendid uh, uh, cathedral. I wish I had other pictures. Uh, with it, but still, this is an ad memoir of some churches built for St. Peter and St. Paul. So we are in London, uh, London, St. Paul's Cathedral, built by this formidable architect, Sir, Sir Christopher Wren. Now, uh, in Germany, after the war, mid century church architecture has beautiful examples. Uh, architects who are not so well known. German architects built very seriously and sensitively churches, probably also the guilt of the nation had something to do with it. These buildings are very convincing. I only show a few images uh, of some smaller churches built for um, uh, you know, Peter and Paul uh, in uh, around 1960s, uh, early 1970s. Here is an image from the inside of a church, and no one can, can say that this is not interesting in terms of space, architectonic expression, and so on. I only have one image from this. Then this is another church built for St. Peter and St. Paul in Germany, mid-century. This one, I think, is also interesting, you know, in its own uh, architectural choices or aesthetical choices. So building for St. Peter and St. Paul. This is another one built mid-century uh, in Germany. Uh, and uh, another one you see at the bottom, St. Peter und uh, Paul's Kirche, uh, not the house on the left, but uh, this one. And I, I truly think sacred architecture should invent, should create, because if man was, was, uh, was uh, given birth to uh, in the image of the creator, and if the creator is and was and will be creative, then the human being should be creative too. Uh, British modern is most spectacular ruin. This building I just discovered in the morning. It's a very interesting seminary, St. Peter's Seminary in Cardros, 1966, again, mid-century. Built by those architects, Gillespie, Kidd, and Koya. I, I don't know who they are, but, but even as a ruin, as an abandoned building, as a vandalized building, I think it is impressive. Uh, and uh, this says something about the spirit of architecture. I, I think they uh, started to um, uh, renew it, to refurbish it. These are images with the building uh, still being uh, affected by graffitis, uh, vandals, and uh, abandonment. But it was a good building, and hopefully it will come back to life. This is a, an image with a project done to restore the building. Uh, that's how it is right now. And right now. It's a seminary, so it's not just a church, but it has that function as well. And now we arrive at this famous uh, building by Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier built four sacred buildings, if I am to include also the House of Shadows, which he probably didn't intend to have it called uh, a sacred building, but I have my thoughts about it. This is Saint-Pierre de Firmini Ver, St. Peter in Firmini Ver, built by Le Corbusier, built after the pro on the projects of Le Corbusier, after Le Corbusier died. So Le Corbusier built, of course, Ronchamp, and then he built uh, the, the monastery La Tourette. Then, after he died, a very loyal architect took upon himself the responsibility to build this very interesting project left by Le Corbusier when he died. And he also uh, built the House of Shadows in Chandigarh. But about that, we'll talk uh, some other time. This is St. Pierre de Firmini Ver. And I think it's a very fine building. I visited it with students from Bucharest. And um, 
besides the fact that it was extremely cold, I mean, it is concrete and we visited it in January, it, it was freezing inside, inside was colder than the outside, but it's a good building. It's a good building and it even inspired a Belgian artist to imagine how it would how it would have looked like or how it would look if it was abandoned uh, to the elements and so on and even vandalized and you are going to see some pictures so again this is the third important sacred space built by Le Corbusier Saint Pierre de Firmini Saint Pierre being of course Saint, Saint Peter um, an image from the inside uh, you know, there is this uh, uh, projection of the, of the openings, I mean, the light goes through. I, I like this fact very much that, you know, it's not, uh, uh, it's a church, but it's also because of this, uh, you know, reference to the, uh, to the constellations of stars on the, on the sky, you know, it unites in a way, uh, you know, Christianity with maybe other forms of uh, spirituality uh, and me maybe even with something outside of spirituality. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a subject we should talk more about uh, some other time. Uh, I mentioned this, uh, this Belgian artist, Xavier de, de Lory, Lory, de Lory, probably it should be pronounced has completed the last in his series of fanciful visualizations, pilgrimage along modernity. So he chose uh, Saint Pierre de Firmini where also, you know, these are visualizations that he did this artist to show transformations of existing buildings, paradigmatic buildings, uh, you know, seen from a different uh, uh, perspective. And I, I think it's interesting, you know, a darkened uh, concrete building, the one that uh, was built based on uh, Le Corbusier's plans after he died. Monumental, mysterious, tragic, uh, abandoned, alone, uh, demanding, uh, judgmental, uh, uh, distant. I don't know, we could describe it with many attributes. But an interesting, uh, an interesting attempt from this uh, Belgian artist to make you uh, aware of a building uh, through, uh, um, you know, through uh, how to say, through, uh, you know, uh, modifying it so you would rediscover it afterwards by contemplating uh, initially or at some point uh, deviant. Uh, uh, visualizations a bit. An interesting building, uh, this one by Le Corbusier, and it was built, I think, very uh, scrupulously and well uh, under the guidance of an architect whose name I should know, and unfortunately I do not. But imagine that an architect, after the death of Le Corbusier, took upon himself the difficult and, uh, you know, uh, yes, difficult uh, responsibility to build this building that was not built during Le Corbusier's time. But it is not like this. Again, this is the visualization of that Belgian artist. We come back to a few more pictures of, um, of the interior of the building. Here is a section through Saint Pierre de Firmini Ver uh, and another view of the interior. Uh, and here you see other, other drawings of this uh, rather impressive uh, uh, project by Le Corbusier. It's not a big building, but it has an inner monumentality, and that is what counts. And of course, you know, the building starts from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cartesian, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cartesian plan. And then it grows slowly towards uh, curvatures. So the, the, the cube uh, becomes a cone, uh, if, I am to, if I am to express myself in this way. And the appropriately, because the square or the cube belong to the earth and the sphere or roundness, the circle belongs to heaven. So the growth 
from uh, you know rectangularity towards roundness it's only natural for what we call sacred architecture and look at the beautiful uh, ornamental work that uh, con the continuously changing light generates on the walls of the of the church saint pierre de firmini, firmini Ver, paris uh, not paris sorry uh, the firmini Ver, le corbusier and uh, uh, the eglise saint pierre at royan france i only have uh, I, I should have searched for more pictures. It's an older building, but I, I find I found it rather impressive in its massivity. Uh, and uh, as I told you, I couldn't I couldn't develop this presentation because electricity left me for a few hours. Uh, and now I think this is the last um, uh, you know uh, part of this uh, insufficient presentation on this subject. St. Petrus House in Capernaum, I think is actually, this is in German, but uh, uh, I think it was built in Israel, uh, Capernaum, the house of St. Peter. It's a modern house, well, house, supposed to be a, a kind of a church built above some uh, ruins. Unfortunately, at this point, I do not know enough about this building, but it, it, it intrigued me, uh, you know, the, the, the images that I saw. Uh, so again, uh, modern architecture and contemporary architecture can very well handle very serious themes in, uh, in sacrality or in sacred architecture. The, the important thing is to be creative. This is the most important thing. I think faith, the best expression of faith is actually creativity. If you are not creative, in my opinion, sorry for the strong language, you betray God. Yes, you betray God, because if man is made in Lupachipuși Asemănarea Lui in Romanian, meaning Lupachipuși Asemănarea Lui Dumnezeu. So if God was creative and is creative, and if we are made in his image and like him, then we are supposed to be creative too. And if we are not creative, we are betraying him. That's what I think. And it's my conviction. That's it. So thank you for being here today.